President of the United States, Senator Rick Santorum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. We appreciate that. Wow, what a great crowd. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, Tim, th thank you very much, Mayor. I uh, appreciate you coming out and welcoming me here to the city. Uh, well, thanks to all the Democrats coming out and welcoming me here to the city, too. I appreciate that, and uh, it is uh, what an honor it is to be here, uh, just to uh, to stand in front of this statue in, in this town that did so much for this country, because this town helped shape and mold Ronald Wilson Reagan, and Ronald Wilson Reagan changed the world. So Dixon, Illinois had a big role in changing the world as we know it. So I always say that, you know, the great thing about America is that we just go on every day and we live our lives. We try our best to provide for ourselves and our family and ordinary people just doing ordinary things. But what we realize in America, those ordinary things, just like the people who were raised with Dutch Reagan here in Dixon, end up contributing to extraordinary things. And that's really the greatness of our country, is the idea that people can come from small-town America many cases, and look in my case, a first-generation American, and have the opportunity because you were someone who were taught the principles of hard work and, and honesty and integrity and doing what's right even when it's hard, doing what's right even when no one's watching you. All of those things that you were taught here in Dixon and in small-town America and across America, those are the things that make our country what it is. That's what makes America unique in the world. We're a country that, from its very inception, believed in the very basic principles that government should be limited and that we should have unlimited potential of the American people. That's a great combination. I have been told by uh, some local meteorologists that uh, our time is short here. <laughs> That the weather has passed, but it is, ba is coming back. Uh, so I'm not going to give a real long speech. I know you'll be very excited to hear that. But I do want to talk a little bit about what Ronald Reagan stands for and stood for and why it's so important that we have a candidate that does that in this election, that stands on the pillars of what Ronald Reagan built as the modern Republican Party. Remember when Ronald Reagan took the helm back in... 1980, he had fought some battles. He had been fighting battles for a couple of decades to try to revive conservatism in this country. And he fought an insurgent campaign against no less a sitting incumbent Republican. Now, we don't have a sitting Republican incumbent running for office this time. But we have someone that is certainly the the choice of the establishment Republican, someone whose turn it was. We see that so often in Republican politics for president. It's almost, almost inevitable who's ever the next in line. That's who the Republicans tend to put forward. And Ronald Reagan said, no, we don't need the next in line. We need something very different. What's going on and was going on in 1976 and, of course, even worse in 1980 was something that was corrosive of the American spirit. We were at a time in the 60s and the 70s that we stopped believing in what made America great. We started believing that government and control of aspects of our lives was what make America stronger. Back in 19, the late 1970s, the word liberal wasn't a dirty word. Now even liberals don't like being called liberals in America. But there's one man who changed that. He changed it not by going out and tearing down his opponents. He went out and painted a vision of who we are, where we came from, and what we can be in the future. That was the greatness of Reagan. It wasn't his rhetoric. As always, he was just a great, great rhetorician. He was someone who could, who could coin a phrase. Reagan would tell you it wasn't his rhetoric. He said it in his farewell address. It was his policies, his policies that were rooted in the greatness of our country. And of course, 
What that means, it, it was rooted in the American people, not a big and powerful government. Hard. And Reagan ran that insurgent campaign in 1976, and people were saying, why don't you get out of the race? You have no chance of winning. And he fought. He won 11 states in 1976. I might add, just parenthetically, that if we happen to win Illinois, that will be the 11th state that I've won in this election. But he fought the battle. He fought the battle in 1976 and laid the predicate in 1980 after four years of misery because unfortunately Republicans did not universally accept his message. He was considered too conservative. Someone who was unelectable because we needed to appeal to moderates. We needed to appeal to Democrats because conservatives and Republicans didn't have confidence in our vision for America. They thought that we had to compromise that vision. We had to be something not true to ourselves, that being true to ourselves as Reagan was, to the conservative principles that our country was founded upon, that that was not a winning formula, that we had to sell ourselves short in order to, to win the election. But we found we didn't win the election. And Jimmy Carter went about the process of weakening America on every possible front. Well, now we have a similar election in some ways coming up in 1980. We have Barack Obama in four years of weakening America in an area that I know would disturb the president, President Reagan, as much as any. We have a president who talks about leading from behind, talking about reducing our military and pulling back from America's influence in the world. We have a president who doesn't believe that America is a source for good. Ronald Reagan quoting John Rinthrop's shining city on a hill to President Obama. We are a source of policy that required this president to go around the world and repeatedly apologize for America and what they did, what we've done in this world. Ronald Reagan would never apologize for the greatest country in the history of the world. Woo! We have in this election a very similar theme. We have a president who's made us weak, who's cut our defense. We have almost, we're approaching a $4 trillion budget over $1.2 trillion in deficits, expanding and exploding the deficit by $5 trillion in a matter of four years. And yet the only place the president can find to cut is defense spending. It's the only place that he's willing to take a pound of flesh. And of course it is the only thing, the principal thing that the federal government has to do that the states and local communities and individuals can't do. And yet it's the area that the president says is responsible for our budget deficits. Yet when I was born, defense spending was 60% of the federal budget. It is now not 60% or 50 or 40 or 30 or 20. It is 17%. And yet it's the one area that President Obama says over and over that we have to cut some more. Let me pledge to you just like Ronald Reagan pledged in 1980. We will build the strongest military on the face of the earth, and I will not cut defense spending. We will have a strong and powerful and forceful America. Ladies and gentlemen, that was one of the legs of the three stools, three-legged stool of President Reagan. Strong national security. Peace through strength. And it worked against a foe that no one thought could ever be defeated. The red menace of the Soviet Union, that power that many on the left said we had to appease, we had to negotiate with, instead of confront and force to its knees. 
Ronald Reagan had the courage to go out and do what our founders were willing to do. Speak truth from our founding documents. Our founders were not afraid to speak of the truth. And when Ronald Reagan got up and called evil, evil, and called the evil empire what it was, oh, the press was in a tizzy. They went crazy. How could we be so inflammatory? The greatness of America, Ronald Reagan knew, was that we did say what was good and what was evil. Yeah. And Reagan also knew that we would no longer be great if we couldn't tell the difference between the two. Oh, there is an evil in this world. It resides in the hearts of radical Islamists who want to destroy freedom-loving institutions, oppress not just those who they disagree with around the world, but in particular they're oppressing people within their own faith, subjecting them to harsh Sharia law and torture and death particularly, of course, in the nation of Iran. And we have a president who got up and said recently that he has Israel's back when we all know he has turned his back on the nation of Israel. We cannot allow, we cannot allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon. I've been saying that for eight years. I've authored bills when I was in the Senate. We actually passed bills over the objection of President Obama, then a senator. But we actually passed bills to put sanctions on Iran, on their nuclear program. Talked about engaging the Persian people. Iran is a Persian country. A country that is not at war with the Jews historically. A country that has a proud and noble civilization that is being now hijacked by a bunch of religious zealots. We had the opportunity to engage them in 2009 in the Green Revolution, and instead of doing what Reagan would have done, which is engage and fight as he did in Poland and other places around the world, engage the freedom fighters, help them to overthrow their oppressors. No, this president sided with the mullahs, sided with those who terrorize and kill freedom-loving people, and particularly Americans. We need a president who will stand up for the very principles that made this country great. Engage the freedom-loving people of this world, not to start a war, to, to prevent a war, and prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon. And of course, one of the most vaunted legs of the stool that President Reagan talked about was he talked about the importance of limited government and free people. Yeah. How many jokes did Ronald Reagan tell about big government? He understood that government was in the way of Free people being able to live their dreams, to, to work and reap the fruits of their labor and take care of themselves and their family and their community because he saw it here. He saw it here in Dixon, Illinois. He saw a community. He saw how we built a great society from the bottom up, one neighborhood at a time. People taking care of each other. Yes, if you were raised in a single home, you had dads down the street who helped out. You had the football coach, the baseball coach. You had the folks at the Y, you had the folks in the civic and the community organization, the library. Everybody looked out for each other. We were a community. Because we didn't have all these government programs to take care of people. It was our responsibility as brothers and sisters in the community to, to look out for each other. Still is. Yeah. And in small town America, as this man just said, it still is. That is, the vi that is the vision that Reagan tried to remind us all of. 
remind us how important it was to allow the businessman, the entrepreneur, to, to make a profit and not condemn them as being rich or greedy or the 1%. The 1% does a lot of hiring of the other 99%, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Ronald Reagan stood for free markets, for a free economy. He would be appalled at looking at what is happening today with the government takeover of health care. Margaret Thatcher, after she left the Prime Ministership of England, looked back at what she had accomplished in, in England at the same time that she served as Reagan did. And she said she never was able to accomplish what Reagan accomplished in America. And she said the reason? The British national health care system. She said once government has their hooks into you, once government makes you dependent upon it for your very health and your lives and that of your children and your loved ones, they got you. No. They got you. And there is no amount of tribute you will not pay to get what you think you need to preserve your health and more importantly, the health of those that you love. That's why Obamacare is the number one issue in this race. It is a race, it's, a, it's an issue about fundamental freedom. It's about whether you will be a generation that will be the generation that well, Reagan talked about. He said freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be, must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same, or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was like in the United States when men were free. No. No! Do not be that generation that Reagan warned about. There's only one way to stop it from being that, that way. And that is to make sure that we nominate somebody who can take on Barack Obama on the issue of health care, on the issue of freedom, on the issue of liberty in this country. Someone who's not been for government mandated health care, someone who hasn't been for top down government control of the health care sector at a state or federal level, but someone who understands how critical, how critical government control of health care is in our society Woo! and is able to go after Barack Obama, make this the central issue. There's a poll out today in four states, excuse me, first in the country that showed that two-thirds of Americans opposed Obamacare and the individual mandate. Two-thirds of Americans. Woo! Why would the Republican Party put up a nominee who takes that issue off the table? Who takes the health care issue and government mandates, both at the state and federal level, which he has supported? Why would the Republican Party Nominate someone on the most important issue of the day, freedom, Reagan's freedom. Why would we take that off the table? That's why you have to help me here in Illinois and help me get elected here in the state of Illinois. And the third leg of the Reagan stool was talking about what he understood, too, as growing up here in Dixon was important. You see, our country was founded on a basic principle that the foundation, that real foundation of American society is not the individual. You build a society on individuals, it's like building a society or a house on grains of sand. You have to build it on something that's a bond, something that's strong, that has cement and glue 
to hold together fast upon which you can put heavy structures on top. And that is not the individual. None of us are out here in society living radically individual lives, not linked together in a way that's important for us to prosper and survive. And of course, Reagan understood that that foundational building block of society was the family. Marriage and the family are at the core and foundation of our society. He also understood that in order to have limited government, you had to have people living good and decent and moral lives. If everybody goes out and says, I'll do whatever I want to do, I'll be my own government. I'll live my life under my rules. Go out after we leave here and drive down the left side of the highway and see how long that works out. <laughs> you can't live according to your own rules. We have to live according to rules that are good and decent and moral and fair that allow us all to pursue our dreams. And when people break those moral bounds, and society becomes a very dangerous place, and government gets bigger, we have to hire more people in uniforms here in this country. And we are less free. These are the basic things we all understand. Edmund Burke said we will be constrained from the chains we put on ourselves or we will be constrained by the chains that men put upon us if we don't do it ourselves. <laughs> Ronald Reagan understood that faith plus family equals freedom in America. Yeah, yeah. Ten that it all works together. I know we're concerned right now about the economy in this country. We've talked about economic liberty and limited government and balanced budgets and less spending and strong families and the faith commitments and all of those things work together to make America work. It, it fits. You can't have limited government unless you have free people living good and decent and moral lives and strong families to help each other out so you don't need government to come in and pick up the pieces when families and communities break down. You can't have a strong national defense unless you have a strong economy and people going out and prospering and living lives that allow us to grow and create the dynamism that our economy has created. Then you can afford to have a strong national security and defend our country. All of these things work together. Reagan understood that these things wove together in a great mosaic that was in fact the United States of America. He understood it and he brought people together on that concept, all based upon the founding principles of our country. Reagan often quoted and relied heavily on our founders people who charted the course for America. In the last few years, we've had a movement in this country that I thank God for because they have resurrected one of those founding documents that was, in many cases, put in the dustbin of history, something called the United States Constitution. Woo! I carry it with me. It's an important and critical document in our country. It's a document that is the operator's manual for America. It's the how the American government is to function. And of course, if you read it, very limited powers are given to the government. Very extensive powers are given to the states and to the people. Woo! That's our freedom! Reagan revered this document. He understood its importance, but he also understood the importance of another document that he quoted often. And another man from Illinois would quote beautifully and frequently Abraham Lincoln, and that was the Declaration of Independence. 
These two men of Illinois knew that the Constitution without the Declaration could in fact be a very dangerous document to the hands of men looking for power. But it was in fact the Declaration that anchored the Constitution. The Constitution is tethered to it. Why? Because the Declaration tells us who we are. There are many on the left who would like to dismiss the Declaration as a document that existed before the American government was established and therefore has no legal binding in America. But it has a moral binding in America. And that binding comes from one phrase that we all know that I'm sure you are taught here in Dixon, Illinois. And that is we hold these truths to be self-evident. Truths. Here's that word again. We hold these truths to be self-evident, apparent to all, people of faith, people of no faith, that all men are created equal. Woo! Yes! Is that true in other civilizations around the world? No. Is it true in the Muslim world? Is it true in no. the third world? Of course not. For those who clamor for equality, understand where that concept comes from. It comes from Western civilization. It comes from the roots of our country, which our founders went on and, and, and laid out in the next phrase. That they are endowed by their Creator. with certain unalienable rights. That our rights do not come from the government. The concept of equality does not come from the government. The concept of truth does not come from the government. It comes from our Creator. This is what made us different than any other country in the history of the world. No other country in the history of the world had ever said that people are equal and rights come from God. No, we came from societies and thousands of years of being ruled by kings who got the rights from God. And then they distributed it to those who they felt were worthy of their rights. And our founders said, no, we believe in the dignity of every human life, that all life is sacred. Yeah. Yeah. And we changed the world because we had a constitution whose job it was to simply recognize the rights that are already written in the heart of every person and there to protect those rights and allow you the American people to build a great and just society to change the world by loosing the human spirit the unlimited potential that Reagan that optimistic man from Dixon used to talk about all the time that infectious optimism why because he saw it he saw it in the eyes of the people out here in Dixon and across this country he saw the potential the spark that human spark that Lincoln talked about he understood the greatness of our country lie in each and every one of you not someone who believes that smart people in Washington should make decisions for people because you are incapable of governing yourself anymore. No. What a pathetic view. Yeah. Yeah. Be us. And we did change the world. For 2,000 years, life expectancy had been 35 in the Western world. We were an agrarian society for 2,000 years up until 1776. And in 230 years, because of America, because of you, free people, life expectancy has doubled. We've gone through an industrial revolution, a technology revolution. Imagine what the world would be like today if we were still having kings and emperors and dictators manage society for their benefit instead of having free people from the bottom up governing America making sure by their actions both by putting the uniform on of our 
military as well as being citizens in this country of keeping America free. At the end of that declaration, the founders wrote this phrase, of which they attached their names to. All of them, men of wealth, property, stature, education. They signed this document knowing they were giving up a lot had they, would they, were they to lose. In fact, they were giving up their life because they were signing a treasonous document to the most powerful army in the world. Yet they did so willingly because they believed so much in that concept that has proven to be that transformational concept in human history. Here we are now who have taken that flame from previous generations who have paid the sacrifice for freedom. We are the descendants of Reagan. Reagan in that generation held that torch high, told those tyrants to tear down walls. Yeah. They were no different. The people of the greatest generation, the people of Reagan's generation, were no different than the people here today. They did what they had to do. They stood up and they rose to the occasion to preserve freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, what is necessary now in America to preserve freedom is for each and every one of you to engage in that struggle in this election. Do not be those people that Reagan talked about who would have to tell their children and children's children what it was like to live in an America where men were free. You don't want to ever have that conversation. And unless we do the right thing in this election, we will be the generation that allowed that torch to go out, that beacon of hope for the world. The best way to make that happen is to make this election like the election of 1980. Don't make it about who can best manage Washington or be the CEO of the economy. We need someone who can talk and strike blows for big things like Reagan did for freedom, and for America. Let's just be brutally honest about it. There's one candidate in this race who can never make this race about freedom because he simply abandoned freedom when he was governor of Massachusetts and he abandoned it when he promoted Obamacare in 2009. You listen to any of his speeches, he never talks about it. He can't talk about it. Why, when that is the most important and pressing issue in our country right now, the big central issue, how can we nominate someone who can't summon the energy, summon the vision, summon the greatness of our country, and elevate the debate to something that is big and important and lasting. You can do that here in Illinois. You can put someone forward who, while not the great communicator himself, can try in our own way to try to communicate that message that is at the heart of what America is. You help us here in the next 24 hours. If you go out and you're willing to vote for me tomorrow, and then, I appreciate that, and that's great, but it's not enough. We're up against being outspent, depending on the press reporter who talked to me here today, either 5, 7, or 10 to 1. Robocalls, radio ads, television ads, all tearing down, tearing down. No vision, no hope. No promise of what America is to be. We must do better than that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I'm asking you what our founders signed in that declaration, to pledge to each other. We mutually pledge to each other, they wrote, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. No one's asking for your lives in the next 24 hours. No one's asking for your fortune. Although if you go to ricksantorum.com, <laughs> pass a hat, but your honor's at stake. The honor of Dixon. The honor of the town that molded this man. What will Dixon say? Will they stand up and uphold freedom? Uphold the legacy of this great man and what he did to this country? What, it, what a difference he made? Or will that have been in vain? Or will be the generation that Reagan feared and talked about in his farewell address that forgot about what America was all about. I need your help. I need you not just to vote for me, but I need you to go out and talk to your friends and neighbors all throughout the state of Illinois. I need you to rise up and speak loudly from the place of freedom here in Dixon, Illinois. And let the voice of Reagan be heard across this land. Thank you very much, and God bless you.